Welcome back to ITACAN conference. I hope you are enjoying so far. I've seen a lot of conversations and also some people who have joined right now. Welcome. Uh, glad to see you all again. Um, the next session is, uh, I find it very interesting for a simple reason. A few months ago, I wrote a few tweets on what some things that I believe should change about software development. And to my surprise, the one that was the most contested was not about writing tests or design or anything technical, but it was about the fact that programming is a much more humanistic activity that we, we think of. And uh, it seems to be a, a strange disconnect for us as technical people that we forget that we work with people and our code is read by people and our designs are used by people and in the end uh, we have applications that are used by people. So we have with us uh, Marco Consolaro who is a software craftsman, technical coach, international speaker, system thinker, semanticist, and philosopher um, and he will talk about soulful socio-technical architecture mixing these two worlds, the technical part with the social part. I've also had a long conversation on YouTube with Marco and we got into some very interesting topics, uh, complex adaptive systems and uh, all these uh, interesting uh, um, ideas. So I can't wait to see what he has in store for us today. Welcome Marco, you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, great event. I hope uh, in the future we can go back and see each other. Also in the real world, virtual is good, but uh, I prefer. So uh, you already say everything about me. Yes, I am a, a software craftsman. I am the co-author of Agile Technical Practice Distilled together with Pedro Santos and Alessandro Di Gioia. Uh, and we recently won the third award uh, for our book. I actually was writing the talk when we received the award, so I had to remake it and add the third uh, uh, award as best new TDD books. That it's uh, perhaps uh, the one we like the most. So let's uh, begin this talk. I want to begin uh, data I used to uh, see uh, the other day, right? This is an engagement study by Gallup of employees. This is a few years ago, but uh, it's uh, in the recent years, things get got worse. So uh, it's still, uh, still more or less valid. Eh? If we see, when I see this data, I was uh, blown away, right? Because uh, I say the United States is the best performer in engagement. They have a little bit more of 30% of their workforce engaged. That means that almost 70% is engaged or actually disengaged, so toxic. Every other country is worse than that. And to me, this data, it's very, very uh, strange, very upsetting. It's not really strange, eh, but uh, it is, uh, I don't like it, right? If my company shows this uh, the level of engagement, I would be very, very worried. And uh, with Icor Academy, we have seen uh, more or less the same kind of data. We have been doing in the last year a survey with a lot of technical leaders. We contact many, many leaders uh, from all Europe to understand from them, to listen from them, what were the problems, the, the top problem they were perceiving. So we found that uh, uh, the top problems are uh, development teams not aligned with business value, entangled team dependencies, and low productivity. Unclear top-down decision-making and lack of trust. Attracting and retaining talent, talents and high turnover. And disengaged and disconnected employee, especially developers. But we know, right? 
I hope uh, we read, but Glencioni, we, we say we say that uh, a healthy organization is one that has less politics and confusion, higher morale and productivity, lower unwanted turnover, and lower recruiting cost than an unhealthy one. That's why in Alcor Academy, our mission is to promote healthy organizational culture where everybody wins. Return of investment for stakeholders, of course, but delighted customers and least but not last, engaged and satisfied employee. And uh, how can we do that? Well, our recipe is about creating soulful socio-technical architectures. And today in this talk, I'll try to explain you what I mean with soulful socio-technical architecture. So let's start. Let's start from the difficult word, right? Social technical. That has a new story. So to explain what this means, I'm gonna tell you a story. And we will go underground. We will go inside the mining industry. And back in the year 1951, when Eric Trist and Ken Bamford came out uh, with an article that uh, was very, very popular at the time. The article was called Some Social and Psychological Consequences of the Long Wall Method of Coal So they were talking about uh, the mining industry in the UK at that time. And what happened in the mining industry at that time was something very, very big. In the 30s, in the beginning of the 30s, they started a revolution in the way that mining worked. They basically uh, decided to introduce new technologies in the mining industry and do it on a large scale. They nationalized all the industry, promising better way to work, better everything, right? When these projects come in, everything is promising, right? And uh, after uh, somewhat 20 years after this revolution, Eric Trist, which, which was a psychologist, and Ken Bamford, an ex-miner, wrote this article where they did an examination of the psychological situation and defenses of a war group in relation to the social structure and technological content of the work system. They analyze what happened after the reform, right? So let's understand a little bit more about mining because from the outside, it seems like easy, right? You go underground, you dig stuff, and that's it, right? Well, if you read a little bit about mining, uh, the way they work is uh, not as simple. And there are various, various skills to understand. The environment over there is very dangerous. So, in the before, therefore, we had a hand got method that was based on smaller growth. And it actually had the technology available until there, there was not uh, industrialization arrived there yet. But uh, after the 30s, they actually had already a lot of industries consuming a lot of coal, so they needed more coal. So they decide to try to uh, uh, morph the tailorism that they put in place in the normal industry also into mining. And uh, actually that was together with the, the introduction of the new railroad systems and bigger tools, uh, better tools, right? Before the reform, the people work a little bit like this with horses and a little cart. Uh, that's a, those are pictures of that time. And today they use some drills like this, right? They were big, but uh, yeah, not that easy to use. And to pick up the coal, it was still a very manual process. While after, and how did the work, uh, how was the work organized? The work, was organized around small teams, two to 20 people maximum. 
internal supervision and self-organization. Those teams were autonomous. When they went underground, they had to self-organize. And to do that, the individual workers developed multiple skills with time, right? Uh, workers were hired by the group and then trained in order to get better and better with time. And the salary and bonuses were negotiated directly by the group. So it was not a direct negotiation by the people. It was the group to negotiate the condition. After the reform, they introduced some machine like this, like very big and very powerful. And to uh, take the coal out, they had trains going underground. Actually, this was one of the first uh, diesel engines that uh, went inside the underground in order to uh, uh, get more capacity to uh, get coal out of the underground. And mining complex started to become like this. They become, they look like big industry, right? And how they changed the way the work uh, was organized. They tried to implement tailorism, right? So the work was organized around bigger teams, 40, 50 people. Three shifts scheduled. <clears throat> we work loads spanning more shifts. They actually introduced shifts. Right? Instead of one shift per day, they had three shifts, one after the other, continuously. But the problem is that there was no handover between the shifts. The individuals were segregated and paid by skill. So no more multi-skilling. You just choose your skill, that's what you do, that's your pay, period. And management directly involved in coordination and control, right? They introduced middle manager, right? Taylorism. So, work? Well, the expected outcome was uh, get the most out of the new technology. Real outcome? Problems with management, of course. Disappointing productivity. Absenteeism and turnover. Here is a picture of a strike at that time. So let's see, let's read a little bit from the report of Trist, right? His words with low productivity despite improved equipment and with drifts from the pits, despite both higher wages and better amenities. Authority have started to be interested in the organizational innovation, right? So the conclusion of the report, very interesting. It says a qualitative change will have to be affected in the general character of the method so that a social as well as a technological whole can come into existence. This was the first document published in 1951 where social and technological whole has been mentioned and give the, the uh, meaning for social technical system design. Let's read a little bit more about what Fritz said, wrote a few years later. This is key. Social as well as the technical system, then a choice can be made that leads to optimum performance of the system as a whole, even if that requires a less than optimum state for the separate dimensions. This is fundamental, this is key. What does it mean? This is a consequence of the theory of the constraint. It means that if we put in a diagram and in the x axis we have the pressure on the technical system and in the y we have the pressure on the social system we can find that and basically zero means that they are idle and the more we go far in the axis the more they are busy right so 
it is uh, it has been observed that the optimal performance of the system can be found somewhere like that and we can always find the maximum valuable pressure point if we push either of the axis doesn't matter what over that point it actually is detrimental for the whole performance of the system when combining a complex independent system local optima actually make things worse that is why when you go in some companies where everybody looks so busy 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 you can already understand from that that there's an organ that's an organization highly inefficient but this uh, conference is about architecture right so we want to build social technical architecture right but uh, here is the, the problem right what do we mean with architecture that's uh, i think the problem right so i went uh, in the cambridge dictionary and i looked for the, the official definition i took away all the definition about buildings right uh, and uh, i have been left with two very interesting so the first one is perhaps the classic definition is the one that uh, we expected to find here right and is the the somewhat the technical definition right the design and structure of a computer system but then there is another definition that uh, to me was very interesting i say architecture is the structure of an organization which influences the relationship between its part and the employees so this definition is somewhat social so which one is the real definition? Is the definition number one or uh, definition number two? Well, to me, they are both the definition, right? Because that's why it's social technical. And if we ask Mel Conway, so I think he agrees with me because he understood that uh, the organization's communication structure influence the design of the system we create so the way the organization the structure influence the digital system and that's why we cannot just think only to the technical part right and that's also why we cannot think only on the social part right why do agile transformation fail because agile transformation without technical practice don't work that, that, that's uh, that, that's uh, easy to uh, see so let's uh, see what i mean as architecture and when we take both these uh, definitions under consideration but uh, as uh, russell ako said your understanding increases the larger the system you comprise and the knowledge increases the smaller element you control you distinguish understanding and knowledge right understanding question why the knowledge has where the question how and what right so let's uh, uh, let's go into the smaller element huh? right which is our code that's the smallest part of this architecture and let's do a journey inside out this time just for a change right and see uh, how architecture uh, has to consider different aspects on different level of abstraction so the uh, perhaps this is what you were expecting me to talk about right about a modular loosely coupled architecture which is the container of our uh, modular loosely coupled software design if we can make it right of course if our software design is not modular and loosely coupled it's very difficult to achieve an architecture which is modular and loosely coupled but uh, the thing is that we don't do code for its own sake code is always done to support another activity it is a mean to an end it's not the end itself so 
modular and loosely coupled adapter. It's not isolated from the world. It has to communicate with something else. And it says that the key in making great and growable systems is much more to design how its module communicates rather than what their internal properties and behavior should be. So what does this architecture communicate? Well, it communicates with other contexts, right? Here the idea is to put together what is related to the same activity and put elsewhere something that is related to a different activity. So also here, it's like moving a layer of abstraction up. It's like if our bounded context were our objects in this level of abstraction. And so how do we focus on the communication of the bounded context? Well, it's the same rule as coupling and cohesion. We need to maximize the communication inside the context and minimize the communication between the boundary of the context. And also, Alan Kay says that it is more important to design how the context communicate among each other than how the context are designed in the internals. So how do the bounded context communicate? Well, to me, it's uh, just in two ways. We have synchronous communication and the synchronous communication. These are the two main uh, ways, right? So we can expose read models for queries with a REST API and give a command in a, in a REST API, right? And for a synchronous communication, we can use messages. This is uh, uh, something that uh, allows us to focus on the communication among the context allowing the internal to uh, be developed in a, a very autonomous way. Also, Akov and Fred Emery, two great system thinkers, say that to manage a system effectively, you may focus on the interaction of the parts rather than the behavior taken separately. It's how the context interacts among each other, the most important thing. So how do we organize this context? That's the architecture that I have in mind. Do we let them emerge uh, autonomously? Do we design them? Do we let uh, somebody from the top organizing the team without asking anything? Or is it design or is it accidental, the way we organize the context? Well, to me, we have something called a boundary stream in every bin. We have a goal and we have a series of activities that uh, uh, allows the organization to achieve the goal. These activities are very different among each other, right? But they are related because each one adds a piece of value that, that needs to be completed by the other one. We can organize our bound context is following this string so that uh, we can focus on what's the data for each activity that uh, needs to be moved from a context to another in order for the new context to start to do its job. For example, if we have an e-commerce website, first activity is to buy the stuff we want to sell, right? Then the second activity is to actually get these items and build a digital catalog. Then we need to publish. And then we need to have a way to ship it to our customer. And then maybe we have the customer service. They need to know about everything happening in this. Uh, and each of these customers uh, is to notify the other one, right? When, we are, when something arrives in the world, when that needs to be notified to the people of the uh, catalog team that needs to get there, get the things and describe it. And then they, when they finish to describe, they need to notify the website that the stock is there ready to be sold, right? And so on, every context, a lot of work by 
So, and sometimes on the relevant information, they need to notify something else. That's what Alan Kay said, right? The communication is the most important thing. So, how do these bounded contexts work? A bounded context is not just some goal, right? It's an activity. There's real people doing a real job supported by a system. So we have business people working to something. They are people. And then we have a cross-functional product engineering team, if you are lucky, right? And this cross-functional product engineering team need to support the business form, needs to automate their task. They need to make their life better on doing that activity, right? They need to work together. Right? And this is something I've seen so rarely in companies, right? But, uh, you know, they say they are a giant principle. Business people and developers must work together daily. Almost never seen this, right? And then they say, oh, agile doesn't work, right? Or well, maybe it's not real agile, what we see around. And uh, when they work together, right? How, uh, how do they work together? And here we have a great book from uh, Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pais that uh, explain a little bit, try to make a little bit of order in the way this thing can work, right? So this thing needs to be to have a well-defined purpose. And those are the stream aligned, the stream aligned about the activities of the business people that do something in order to add value. Those are the most important. And usually when a company is small, just have these kind of things. And the other kind of thing, as a company scale has needs to uh, or uh, implement something more complicated or to uh, consolidate a uh, uh, thing uh, for uh, every department. So you can have a platform thing that actually act as a provider of services. And then you have enabling team like the Delta Force team, teams that uh, based on their requirement can go and help other teams to achieve a particular goal. This is uh, uh, even not enough, right? So, yes, designing these things is fundamental. But then, how do they collaborate? Do you design the way they collaborate, or is it random? Is it uh, accidental? There's different way they can collaborate. They can uh, do a real collaboration where somebody of some team for a small amount of time go to work. Uh, with inside another team until they complete the uh, they arrive to the goal. The X as a service. So a team become a, a service provider for another one. So no, and the other one become a customer of the service provider or a, a facilitation way where a doc, some team has the help of members of the other team. And uh, uh, we can design this thing. We cannot leave it accidental. And also the size of the team, that's crucial, right? Because we have a limited mind. We, we think we are very smart, but unfortunately, uh, we are far than smart enough to uh, deal with uh, bigger teams. Right? The bigger the team were among the team members, that is a, a big problem in big team, right? That's why uh, I prefer small team and also small company, to be perfectly honest. And what uh, they say in this book, also then optimizing for flow. How do we optimize for flow? Well, avoid handovers by using autonomous cross-functional teams equipped with all the skills necessary to complete the job. Then keep team stable, but not frozen. They need to evolve by following the emerging needs, right? A company and organization is not something static, it's something that needs to evolve. And focus on the quality of the collaboration. Trust awareness 
and learning. Learning is very important. Imagine a network of autonomous multi-skilled teams united by purpose and value. How far can you go? Unfortunately, the reality is not always like that. A rigid hierarchy of power. Okay, this is an inspection from the top manager in the mining industry. Can you see the difference? Who's the manager? Okay. A rigid hierarchy of power. United by command and control. Where is it to feel like a number? Just a replaceable cog without any special skill. Welcome in the corporate pyramid. Exchange for some money, we sell the most precious thing that we have in this world. And this reminds me, this Ponzi scheme of power reminds me of another pyramid from my school book in primary school. The feudal pyramid. And this authoritarian model is what destroys the soul of your team. Because joy, feelings one whom value, being appreciated and loved by others, feeling useful and capable of production are all factors of enormous value for the human soul, says Maria Montessori. Or a few centuries before, Democrito say that happiness resides not in possession and not in gold. Happiness dwells in the soul. And it's when we are happy, when we are uh, <clears throat> enthusiastic to go to work, work when we in the office, they all nice how something good. When we are happy, we are creative. When we are not happy, when we uh, go in the office and the moment we open the door, we are like, oh my God, another day here. It's impossible we get creative inside there. How creativity works. If you go out in the morning and discover that they stole your car down the road, are you happy to go and uh, doing a painting or doing something creative? No, you want to destroy them because you are angry. And that's what destroys creativity. So being happy is absolutely important. That's why the social technical architecture needs to be soulful. And how can we make it soulful? I will give you a little receipt. But first, let's go back to the miner, right? Did they fix their problems at the end, right? So uh, they did a few experiments. What Eric Trist wrote a few years after uh, describing the new experiment they have done. So he said that the research team found what conventional wisdom had held to be impossible. They see, it was impossible that this will work. The working of the conventional semi-mechanized three-shift cycle by a set of autonomous wardrobe. They say it was impossible. Autonomous wardrobe cannot do this. Well, they instead uh, came out with the idea of the composite long wall. How was it? So first they reintroduced autonomous multi-scale wardrobes. Instead, a payment of a group on a group bonus system. So each group were paid uh, differently, negotiating by itself. They removed the segregation, both in shifts, and also they introduced the uh, proper handover. Right? So the shifts uh, were not just uh, one go, the other come in. There was a time where the first shift told the second shift what was the state of the world after the shift. And the internal supervision 
was made by leaders elected by the workers. They basically kick all the manager out from underground. You see, the managers, you can take that back. So, outcome of this, absenteeism cut in out. Decreased incident and sickness. No more turnover. Reduced overall cost, productivity plus 25%. Keep the managers out in order to achieve that. Because the problem with command and control is control rather than command. As John Seddon said, I agree with this. Why? Easy, right? If you really trust someone, would you control him? You control somebody, that's the proof you don't trust them. And trust lies at the heart of a functioning, cohesive team. Teamwork is almost impossible, says Patrick Lenchoni in the five dysfunction of a team. Highly suggested book, right? Trust is foundational about now trust. The soul of your team is doomed. So first suggestion to create soulful socio-technical architecture is reject common and control and bureaucracy, giving decision power and budget directly to teams. And this is the autonomy check of Daniel Pink. I hope you read Daniel Pink book Drive. Yeah, and I, I copied this uh, pink check from uh, Alberto Brandolini. But uh, in effect, also in a salary, they show it, right? Approval by a manager or uh, a change uh, approval bureau simply doesn't work to increase the stability. But it works really well to slow things down. In fact, it's better don't have it at all. Also, Russell Lacombe says that the effectiveness of authority decreases as the educational level of subordinate increase. Right? When the educational level of subordinate is higher than that of their bosses, and this is almost always the case in IT departments, eh? it becomes negative. Authority in IT departments is toxic. So, another thing we can do is replace personal bonuses and performance reviews with team or organizational work. And this is about purpose. Why is this important? Because uh, as Deming says, 95% of the workers' performance is governed by the system. So it doesn't make sense to have ad hominem performance review and pay. That is just to coerce the people to listen to the manager, otherwise they don't have the pay review. That's why they do ad hominem, to give authority to who wouldn't have any other way. But not least, give special attention to activities that foster workers' relationship around the skill. It's not the ping pong table, it's not going to drink in the pub, it's not playing pool downstairs. It's about creating a community around the skills that we need to grow from each other. And this is about mastery, but not only that. What are these activities? There are many, many, many. Many things, right? Learning time and budget. Education and speaking. Conference allowance. Innovation time. Some years ago, everybody did innovation time, like Google, right? Two days per month, you could do whatever you want to create innovation. Now it's disappearing. Now no one talk about that. Now no more innovation, right? Professional training, for example, right? 
we think uh, we know everything. Well, we have many people that uh, come in our training and after says, oh, I thought I was a great developer. Before I did your training, I learned so much. And I also realized there's so much more things to know. I, that's uh, something that is very good if you want to challenge your things. Community of practice. That's fundamental. How do we uh, share among teams the great discoveries about how to use a technology that might save uh, hours of development to the other I have communities in order to do that. And the great thing about creating a community events around their, the skills of the people, because people are not our greatest asset. It's the relationship between people that are our greatest asset. How much people care for each other. And there's nothing like learn together to create amazing relationship with people. We see in our training all the time. They come there, they start a month, they don't even know each other. By the time they finish the course, they become best friends. They organize themselves to pair together in the evening to resolve a kata. Right? That's magic. That's uh, the most important thing. The relationship that you create when people learn together. I close with uh, my favorite definition of social technical system design. She was a sociologist, but also a computer science scientist. She says that social technical system design provides a new worldview for what constitutes quality of working life and humanism at work. It facilitates organizational innovation by recommending the removal of many elite groups and substituting with flatter hierarchies, multi-skilling and group decision-taking. We want to replace tight controls, bureaucracy and stress with an organization technology that enhances human freedom, democracy and creativity. It wants to foster the soul of the team. Because when one social technical system has a soul, magic will happen. So, what do you think this is? Is it a cathedral? Is it a church? It's a soul mine near Krakow. Everything you see, you see here has been done by the miners, not by artists. They started to use the decoration of their environment to self-organize and learn how to use the tool Why they were carving this beauty in the environment they had to share for so long. Look what they have done. No manager told them to do this. They were self-organizing. They, with the decades, made this place. This is where they gathered together underground in the moments where they were idle, in the moments where they had a break. They always meet here. So they decide to make it better, to use the time they have to, in one side, learn how to use the tool, and the other, make beautiful the environment where they have to live. And that creates a sense of community that created something that in the course of decades made this place a masterpiece of art. Look at this sculpture. It wasn't Michelangelo, it was the miners. They became so good with time. And they also made a reproduction of the Last Supper of Leonardo. So, once upon a time, Fred Hasbar say, if you want someone to do a good job, give them a good job to do. I'm not sure if the miners would agree. I would rephrase it. If you want a job, build a soulful, social technical architecture. Thank you.
Thank you, Marco, for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, there are a few things that I'm thinking of, uh, many things that I think of. One of them is um, related to feedback, because you mentioned trust as part of like the fundamental value. But then the one that's very close to it is giving feedback and receiving feedback. And I'm curious how you see this in the context of your uh, idea of soulful socio-technical architecture. Well, I think that uh, uh, inside a smaller team where everyone acts uh, directly, the feedback should be continuous. I, yeah, a performance review was a year. No, it's every day, it's every minute. It's every time I see something. And the feedback is not to say you are good, you are bad, you will have the pay review, will not. Uh, usually, the, those kind of feedbacks are like, okay, this person will not have a pay review. Let's invent a reason to don't give it. Right? Yeah, it's, a, it's details, they are two different things. They are not even related. Money is one thing, work is another one. And that work is about getting better in what we do. It's about get the system better in what we do. It's about trying to understand where we can improve. Personally, as a team, as the way the teams are organized to work together. And the feedback is continuous about this. Uh, by the way, are getting a lot of claps on the chat, so <laughs> people have enjoyed your your talk. Uh, there's only one I question. Feel, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and they are thanking you. So there's one uh, question from Michelle. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for asking. Have you ever seen a company moving away from a command and control habit to a more socio-technical view? How did it go? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's the problem of our time. It is like this because the world has been designed like that, in my opinion. And uh, uh, this is why I promote this in my talks, because uh, I understand how evil and toxic command and control is. Sooner or later, the world will move on. Okay. So, given that this was the only question, and you had such a such a deep and interesting uh, 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 session, um, we are also out of time. I'd like to to chat much more with you, but we have to make a longer break to take a longer break now, about half an hour. Thank you so much for uh, participating on. For, Invite for me again, time. so we can carry on from here. Sure, that would be great. All right, see you soon. Bye. Bye. We'll be back in half an hour.